show. Uh, thank you guys all for joining us. Um, my name is Brad Nahill. Um, Sabine, I'm going to mute you real quick. Um, my name is Brad Nahill. I'm the director of, I'm the president of Sea Turtles. And um, welcome to the first of our series of webinars. We've done a couple, but our hope is now to start doing them monthly. And uh, we'll see if we can do it every month. We'll send out email. So you signed up, you'll get an email about it. Um, other topics that we're going to cover include things like the tortoise shell trade. It's a big issue that we've worked on as an organization. Uh, we're going to talk about sea turtle nesting beaches. It's always fun to see lots of video and pictures of little baby turtles. And um, just to give you an idea of what it's like to work with on a nesting beach. So that'll be another one. Um, so we're going to look at a few different topics. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll get all those finalized and I'll get information um, out to everybody. Um, I'm going to do a very quick overview of what Sea Turtles is in case you're not um, familiar with our organization and, and what we do. And then we will um, jump in with our panelists. So let me share my screen here real quick. So um, this webinar is about sea turtles and plastic. You've probably heard about um, you know, the, how sea turtles eat plastic, how it impacts them. So we're going to get kind of into the details of how that's working, some of the research that's doing, the problem of plastic pollution, and what some organizations are doing to um, to reduce the amount of plastic in the ocean and on the beaches for sea turtles. Um, so this, uh, this webinar series is going to loosely um, align with a new book, something I'm very proud of. I recently um, published a book that uh, had a whole bunch of friends from the sea turtle world contribute articles to. So two of our speakers participated in this book, Danny Gonzalez. Uh, and and Sabine, Ber oh, Berenz, Beren I should have asked you that beforehand. I'm so sorry. And Sabine, who will who will give us the correct pronunciation of her name once we uh, once we get to her. I'm going to send out a link to this. This is all about lessons from the field. So people working around the world with sea turtles, learning about them and sharing their experiences and and what they've learned. And I'm really appreciative for Sabine and and Danny um, to participate in that, and among um, many others. Real quick, I'm gonna plug in late March, we're gonna do a virtual fundraiser that we're very, very excited about. Some of you guys may have heard of uh, my colleague and good friend, co-founder of Sea Turtles, Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, who's written a um, New York Times bestselling incredible book called Blue Mind and has an extraordinary um, breadth of experience in the sea turtle world. We're gonna talk about the tortoiseshell trade with a few people who have worked on it and seen it firsthand. Um, we're going to announce a new program that's going to be coming up soon. I'm not quite ready to announce it, but we're really excited about it. Um, we're going to do a little virtual tour of some of the nesting beaches that we work on. We're going to talk about the trips that we do. We're going to give some stuff away. So I will send out that information shortly. Um, our programs, we have a few different programs. Our best known one, Billion Baby Turtles. We raise funds from people from around the world, students and companies and um, others, individuals. And we use that money to support important turtle nesting beaches around the world. So far, we've supported more than 40 beaches. We've given away more than half a million dollars. And with that, we've helped save more than 4 million hatchlings so far. So we're really proud of, of that program. Um, we, we have a program called True Rare to Wear, which works on the tortoiseshell trade. If you've seen products like this, if you have something like this, it's probably plastic, hopefully. Um, but these are sold around the world and it's a really big problem that sea turtles face. And so we have a program called True Right Aware that educates people on how to recognize these products and how to avoid them. Um, and then we have conservation trips. So you can join us to go work hands-on with sea turtles in different places around the world, including places like Costa Rica, uh, we have a trip in June. We have a Galapagos trip, which we're hoping to run in April. We're going to kind of see how the, the situation is by then. Um, we go to Baja. Uh, we go to Belize. So lots of fun trips. I will send out um, after the uh, presentation 
links to all of our different programs, links to all the great stuff that our panelists are working on, where you can pick up the book if you're interested, all that kind of stuff. So I'll follow up with that and I will follow up with the, um, let's see, screen share. Okay, great. Um, I'll follow up with all that stuff with the recording as well. So for anyone who's um, not able to see it. So um, three panelists today. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Christine Figener. Um, she just alerted me that she's based in Costa Rica and there's some weather issues. So we're going to cross our fingers that her power doesn't go out. Um, I'm going to ask you to unmute there, Chris. Um, so we call her Chris. She is the director of Coasts, which is a grassroots sea turtle conservation organization in Costa Rica. Um, wonderful beach called Gondoka that is really deep in, in my heart, a place where I've spent a whole bunch of time. Um, she's also the science and education director for the Footprints Foundation, which is something you should check it out. Follow them on Facebook. They put out lots of great content about plastic and, and this issue. And um, she's also made probably best known, definitely best known for uh, the video. If you've seen the video of the uh, turtle with the, with the straw in its nose, the researchers out on a boat in Costa Rica removing the straw from the nose, that was filmed by Christine. It's been, what, 35 million, 40 million views now? What are we up to? What's your latest count? I think across all platforms, it's like 100 million at this point. 100 million, my yeah. Lord. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I know, you know, we've talked about this. Christine didn't intend for that to, to help set off a movement and to raise awareness around this issue. It was just recording something. They didn't even know what it was. Um, but, you know, that video has, I really think, I mean, lots of people were working on plastic pollution before that, Plastic Pollution Coalition and, and others. But that video really seemed to galvanize attention around this issue. And um, I think it's had a tremendous impact. So, with that, um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Chris. There we go. Now your host. So you should be able to um, pull your presentation up. Okay. Let's see if it works. If it's like really iffy, like let me know and then maybe you can share it in case it's getting really shaky. Gone. Okay. Yeah, Brad already gave me this really nice introduction. I'm super excited to be part of this webinar and talk about a topic that is not just sea turtles, but actually something else that's really near and dear to my heart because it directly affects our turtles that probably a lot of us love and cherish. And I would love to give you just to kind of set the stage for the next talks, just a little intro into plastic pollution in general for those of you that are not totally familiar with all of the topics. And then of course, I would like to mention, you know, why that all matters to our sea turtles. And then also what you at home can do to help sea turtles in the ocean, even now during the pandemic with little actions from home. Yeah. So the facts, uh, unfortunately, it's not that great <laughs> uh, or it's not that positive, let's say that way, but most plastics that we use uh, nowadays are made from fossil fuels, so petroleum based are most of them. Um, of course, there's other stuff like bioplastics that I'm going to talk just really briefly later about, but um, that goes, of course, hand in hand with climate change, another major issue that also sea turtles con sea turtle concern. And I mean, the numbers sometimes are so abstract, but we are producing right now around 380 million metric tons of plastic each year. I don't even know if that's something that we can really envision. I always have trouble doing that, but it's a lot. And really unfortunate is that 50% of that plastic is actually used for single use items. So items that are used literally only for minutes, for seconds, but then remain on this planet for hundreds and hundreds of years to come, 
because plastic doesn't just disappear. It doesn't actually biodegrade. It actually turns or breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces and becomes first microplastics and then nanoplastics. And in that form, it actually exists still on this planet. So we are even meant to double this production within the next like 10, 15 years. So there is no real side of that getting any less, which is really unfortunate. And right now, where there's so much pressure on the fossil fuel industry, the fossil fuel industry is actually kind of banking on the plastic production to save their butts. So the next bad news is to know now that probably everybody feels already tired of the problem because I mean, I don't think there's anybody in this webinar that can say I've never used plastic in my life. And actually we researchers we use way too much of that. Uh, and plastic, you know, is a great product. I don't want to lie about it. I mean, it has made so many things possible in technology, in science, in medicine, but it is also based on a narrative or the success that has been based on a narrative where a lot of the responsibility of what happens to the plastic is placed on the consumer. And that is actually a huge lie because it is always talked about plastic recycling, but effectively up until today, and I mean, plastic production has started like right around World War II, where it was really cranked up. Um, only about 10% of plastic, and that's probably even very, very favorably, has been recycled so far. So the really sad story is that the industry knew already that this will never be more than that likely, but they kept on telling us, even now, I mean, the big polluters that I will call out later on, they're still telling you, you know what, it wouldn't be a problem if you as a consumer would be recycling. So we have the issue and actually most of the plastic that has ever been produced is still on this planet today. So when we talk about plastic pollution and sea turtles, of course, we have to look not just everywhere, but specifically into the ocean. And what we see there is that per year, I mean, the, the stats kind of differ from year to year and also which publication you look at, but on average, it's about 8 million metric tons of plastic that makes its way into the oceans. And the really, really interesting thing probably is because a lot of people probably believe, oh, that is um, one of the cruise ships that dumps their trash or the fishing boats that dump all their stuff into the ocean but actually 80% is from land-based sources. So that means it's actually trash that was likely disposed of responsibly, um, has been a landfills, but you know the next hurricane, the next floods, and those things still end up in the drainage, in the sewage, in the rivers, and eventually end up in the ocean. So, and now talking about sea turtles, why does it all matter to our sea turtles? So sea turtles, are actually kind of the sentinels of our oceans. So they're a good indicator of showing us what is going wrong with our oceans. And at this point in time, really every single sea turtle species, there are seven of them worldwide, have been documented to have ingested plastic, which is really, really sad, first of all. And then if you look at you know the entire uh, number of individuals of turtles, it's estimated that 52% at the very least have ingested plastic. And of course, ingestion is not the only thing that could happen between turtle and plastic. So Brad already mentioned my video, it might end up in weird orifices in, in the body, but the most common ones are definitely ingestion. So the turtles think it's food, it ends up in the digestive tract, it can cause blockages or perforations and often end with the death of the turtle. The other thing is of course, entanglement. So that is often, of course, fishing lines or kind of big bags and things that turtles get stuck in. But there have also been documented cases of turtles getting stuck in huge car tires, for example. So um, that can lead to death because turtles are air breathing. So if they're not able to surface, they will actually drown. Or it can lead to really, really, really ugly wounds and even amputation of certain body parts, uh, likely the flippers. Uh, and then the other part is, of course, sea turtles need to get out to nest and the babies eventually when they hatch need to make their way to the ocean. And we have a lot of nesting beaches worldwide that are completely covered in plastic and all of those, the moms making their way up on the beach and the babies trying to make their way to the water are blocked 
or maybe even otherwise disturbed by the plastic that they encounter. So there have been cases of baby turtles been found in plastic bottles, in gallons, in other plastic objects. And it is already a really, really, really tough life for baby sea turtle. And they really don't need to have more trouble on the beach because of plastic. And just as a fun fact, maybe the first official record of um, yeah, ingestion of plastic in sea turtles was in 1981 in a leatherback turtle that had a plastic bag in its stomach. And a recent publication in 2009, I think it came out, but the, actually the same author, um, they looked back onto old necropsies of leatherbacks and were able to find evidence of plastic pollution or plastic in the GI tract as far back as the 1960s or the late 1960s, I think it was 1968. So it has been a problem for a while. And yeah, only recently really it has become, I hope, a global concern and people really moving towards changing all of that. But how can we change it, right? So I already said that the narrative or the onus has been a lot of times splashed onto the consumer, uh, but where is the majority of plastic actually produced? And when we look at the stats, this is from 2015, you can see that packaging is actually one of the major contributors to plastic pollution. And um, only where it says the consumer products, it's probably things like single use plastics. Um, I don't know exactly how they broke that down, but packaging of course is super important for our foods, for, for our stuff that we buy, right? Let it be cosmetics, let it be uh, a new computer, all of that is packaged somehow. So we have to kind of go to the source and try to turn off that tab and think about alternatives of how this can be packaged differently and plastic free. And in my opinion, we should hold uh, responsible and accountable the big polluters. So this is the brand audit from last year, 2020, uh, from Break Free From Plastic. And you can see it is probably a little bit more than a handful, maybe two handful of companies that are really the major polluters. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Nestle, Unilever, maybe Unilever not even because they're kind of having other brands and you kind of need to look for the logo in the back who is actually owned by Unilever. Um, but yeah, so these are the companies that actually need to step up and do better. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, they're not trying to make a real change, but they do a lot of greenwashing. So right now there's a lot of talk about bioplastics, for example, and bioplastic implies, or the name implies that it is immediately good for the environment, right? Because, well, I don't know, I think people envision that it's biodegradable, first of all, and then second of all, it's made maybe from something that is not fossil fuels. But the reality, unfortunately, is that bioplastic is no term that is really defined and could mean anything. It can either mean it is made from, like, for example, a plant-based uh, material, but could be the same exact plastic chemically. That means it is totally non-biodegradable. Um, or it is actually still made from petroleum, but it's then biodegradable, or it is both, which would, of course, be the perfect the perfect scenario. But even then, a lot of products say it is compostable. But if you read the fine print, it is actually not compostable in your home compost, but it needs an industrial composting facility, which just as an example, the US, I think, has about three to 400 of it. So that means not even every, um, yeah, every community has one. So that means it will end up in the landfill and will not break down properly. Yeah, so that means what I, or like the message that I really want you to take away is that we all have to become informed consumers, right? So we will not get fooled by those companies trying to tell us that this is better than what they tried to do before, just because it's an easy way out of producing plastic. Because this is literally a statement that Coca-Cola did last year in Davos at the World Economic Forum, where the head of sustainability actually was really said that allegedly their customers still want plastic bottles. You know, my uh, appeal to all of you is please, we do not need those kind of, we don't need kind of statements. 
we really need to become better consumers. And what we can do is, first of all, of course, we can call them out, right? So the brand audit that I just introduced, it's like we're not trying to just say, yeah, well, there is this big company. No, it's Coca-Cola that is actually causing a problem or PepsiCo. So, you know, if you find something on the beach, use your social media and post a picture and tag Coca-Cola or whoever else it's from and say, hey, Coca-Cola, is this yours? It is really effective. And I mean, this is how the ball has become or started rolling already. And many of those companies have held the side, side guys definitely and know they need to change something. But we still need to put more pressure onto them. And I mean, one easy way, of course, is to boycott those companies uh, and products that use too much plastic. Um, I know that it's not always possible. And of course, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect all the time. But the more people choose other options, um, the more alternatives we actually will have because those companies will go where the money is. And that means the landscape of products can change entirely. I have even seen it just in the past five years where there was no alternative sometimes to certain products. All of a sudden, we have so many options of plastic free products. And you can, you know, emphasize that even more. You can demand plastic-free alternatives in your schools, in your universities, at your workplace, at your grocery stores, at your local restaurant that you like frequent very often, at your bars. And you will see little by little people will change and alternatives will pop up. And of course, um, even though you might be the <laughs> the person that is not very or not going to get invited very often anymore, but you can educate friends and family. I mean, you don't always have to do with a raised finger, but a lot of times it's even easier to just lead by example. You know, do your thing and people will ask questions of why you're doing it. For example, why do you take your reusable shopping bag? Um, why do you have a, a metal straw? Those kind of things. It always is a nice conversation starter. So just little changes to your lifestyle and habits can go a long way because it's not just what you produce, but who you inspire with that. And what I, what's also really important to me is, you know, there's so many people that do a great job of living zero plastic or plastic free um, perfectly. But the thing is that we don't need just a few people doing it perfectly. We really need everyone to do, you know, their part and doing it as imperfectly or as perfect as they want to without shaming everybody, everyone, anyone, anyone actually. Yeah, so this is just some ideas of what you could do to use less plastic, help our turtles in the ocean. And just remember, we vote with our money. Uh, we definitely consume way too much and we can consume less and we can change our habits and eliminate plastics in our daily lives pretty easily. Yeah, and with that, Thank you very much. And maybe there are some questions. Thank you so much, Christine. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, just a, just a couple quick things. You were talking about the biodegradable cups. As an experiment, I took one of those. I got it at the local zoo at an event. And I put it in my compost at home just to see what would, would happen. When I moved 10 years later, it, you couldn't even, it, it didn't look any different than it did, um, you know, 10 years previously when I had put it in my compost. So that's really not a, um, a, great, um, a great option. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think let's, let's do one quick question and then we'll go on to the next speaker. Um, this is from Martha. Do you think one of the problems are just single use or are also multi-use products a problem as well? Well, I mean, multi-use or like products that are designed to be multi-use products should be, of course. I mean, if you buy, you know, a reusable plastic bottle, I hope you will use it for the next 10 years and not just for once or twice and then you throw it out because those products are actually probably even worse to recycle and break down. So I think sometimes also this idea of going plastic-free sometimes lead to people buying more and new stuff and, you know, a lot of times it's really about reducing what you're buying and reusing what you already have got. So if you got plastic, I mean, it's not super healthy, unfortunately, but if you don't heat it up um, and use it maybe to plant some plants or something, uh, if you have like, I don't know, Tupperware or something like that, um, definitely try to reuse it and don't just throw it out because now all of a sudden you're plastic free. Okay. 
Um, and then one other quick one. Have there been any studies finding the amount of microplastics sea turtles consume? There have been some uh, studies done on that, um, not like the max amount of, of what sea turtles can consume, but there has been a study that actually has tried to quantify how much microplastic, if it's not the direct cause of death, might impede or might influence the death of or like the, the possibility of, of a death in a sea turtle. And I think don't nail me down. And I think it was like 11 pieces of plastic or something like that, that where you could see like an increase in the in the uh, morbidity. So um, microplastic is really different, difficult to quantify also because it's really difficult to find in the turtle in the first place. So especially if the turtle is still alive. Yeah, yeah, I think it was 14. Um, Danny actually talks about it a little bit in the next presentation. Sabine, I, I saw you had a question. Let's go. I'm going to go to the next presenter. We'll give that. I want to make sure that we have enough time for um, Danny's video and, and Sabine's presentation, and then we can take more questions um, at the end. If folks want to stay a little bit more than an hour, we can do that. Um, you can see all of Christine's uh, information here. Follow her on social media. She's a great follow. Um, so. All right, I am going to make myself the host here. And so you may have noticed that, here, let's hold on one second. I need, um, Christine, I think I need you to make me the host again. It, it had let me do that before, but it's not now. Do you see how to do that? Like you click on me and then more. Thank you. So um, you may have noticed that we had three presenters, but only two of them are showing up here. That's because our next one, uh, Daniel Gonzalez, is based in Spain, where it's about 4.30 in the morning. And I wasn't going to ask him to do that. So we pre-recorded his presentation. So I'm going to uh, go and play that now. Let's see. Let me pull that up. And then give me one second. Hey, I'm joined by Daniel Gonzalez Paredes, who has extensive experience in the field of uh, conservation of sea turtles. He's been working on diverse projects around the world, uh, including working with an organization that I um, have known for years and have a tremendous respect for, Carumbe, in Uruguay. Um, he has a Master's of Advanced Studies in Marine Biodiversity and Conservation from Scripps Institution in the United States. <clears throat> currently, he's pursuing his PhD at James Cook University in Australia, although he's currently in Spain um, at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah. because, of the, because of the pandemic, you know, everybody's not exactly where they need to be all the time, right? <laughs> um, he's an active member of the International Sea Turtle Society, where he leads workshops on marine debris and sea turtles and uh, is a founder of Plastic Free Turtles, uh, an organization that we will talk a little bit. Um, above that, you know, Danny's a, a good friend, uh, often a DJ at the International Sea Turtle Symposia, where he's one of the most fun people in the sea turtle community. Um, Daniel, it's uh, Danny, I should say. It's really a pleasure having you join today. Thank you so much for, for taking your time to, to talk to us about your research. Yeah, Brad. Thank you for uh, for your invitation, and and I'm glad to to participate in this uh, webinar, and and also to to share this this event with um, Chris and and Sabine. Um, yeah, let's talk about the. Uh, let me share the the, the presentation. Um, I would like to talk today about the the plastic pollution issue in, in can you see my, my screen all right um, so yeah i would like to talk uh, about the plastic pollution issue in in uruguay and, and how it is affecting the the sea turtles uh, there and, and um, yeah an overview also about uh, how we are dealing with this with this issue 
right? Um, <clears throat> first of all, let me let me introduce the topic. Um, Uruguay is a small country in South America between uh, Brazil and, and Argentina. Uh, it has uh, more than 600 kilometers of coastline, uh, but it in, in on the east by the Atlantic Ocean and on the south by the Rio de la Plata estuary. Uh, it is a, <clears throat> a gorgeous coastline. It's a, it's a wonderful coast. But the problem is that the area is uh, reaching alarming levels of, of plastic pollution. Uh, and, and most of these plastics come from, from two main sources. Uh, the garbage come from big cities such as uh, Buenos Aires and, and Montevideo within the estuary uh, with very poor waste management plans. And all the debris coming from uh, surrounding rivers which drain into the into the Rio de la Plata. And moreover, this this accumulation of plastics is uh, enhanced by uh, a couple of, of important factors. Um, in one side, we have uh, a benthic salinity front uh, within the estuary, which we we can see in this uh, sad uh, image. Uh, uh, so this uh, this front adds as a barrier. Uh, trolling the garbage uh, on, of the Rio de la Plata. <clears throat> and on the other side, um, the convergence of two main currents, uh, the Brazilian current on the north and, and the Malvinas current on the south, just offshore Uruguay, which create a, a kind of vortex and, and at the end, an aggregation zone for, for plastics. Um, about the turtles, uh, uh, the green sea turtle is the, the most abundant species in the area. Uh, Uruguayan water hosts uh, a missing stock of early juveniles uh, recruited from different properties in the, in the Atlantic. We are talking about a turtle of uh, yeah five to six years old, a bedagging 41.5 centimeters of coverage length. <clears throat> this is the um, uh, this is the distribution of the stock, and and this area is considered as a key feeding and development area for green turtles in the in the South Atlantic region, um, and and particularly the occurrence of uh, green turtles in Uruguay is is rather susceptible. Uh, it's uh, it's during the summer. Temperature is about 20 Celsius degree, that we have the highest aggregation of turtles. And during the winter, um, uh, because of the prevalence of the Malvinas current, the water drop uh, the temperature to 40, 30 Celsius degrees. So most of the turtles tend to migrate northward uh, following the receipt of the, of the warm warmer water of the Brazilian current. Uh, and, and, and this is a, an important, this is a, a key point since the green turtle when are feeding on the coastal waters of Uruguay, they feed uh, on macroalgae, may, mainly on macroalgae and, and a few gelatin sprays. And when they migrate, they go offshore uh, entering in the pelagic, entering in pelagic waters because the the, um, the limit of the platform is uh, is close to the coast, so they enter in, in pelagic waters and and there the turtle shift to an omnivorous diet and, and and it's precisely the combination of these two factors, uh, the feeding behavior adaptability of the turtles coupled with the um, with the overlapping of <clears throat> garbage patches and K habitats made green turtles uh, be quite exposed to, to ingestion of plastic in, in this area. Uh, um, yeah, and the numbers speak by themselves. This, uh, this, this is the data related to 10 years of work. Uh, we usually rescue around 30, 40 turtles per year and attend between to, to 17 uh, stranded events annually. 
Um, and yeah, and during uh, all this time, we have been witness and how the plastic gestion have been increasing on the time ratio. We have we have previous studies uh, indicating that in 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 2013 already 75 of the stranded turtles that we manage presented plastic ingestion. And this is some more recent data uh, regarding one of the last seasons uh, when we got managed to rescue 50 turtles and attend 78 stranded events and 96 percent of these turtles are uh, we are talking about a stranded turtle with the gut full of plastics or rescue turtles uh, defecating plastic fragments uh, every single day. And this is uh, this, uh, uh, very dramatic. <clears throat> so uh, given this scenario from Karun Benjio, uh, we are dealing uh, with this issue from three different approaches which are the basis of all our conservation efforts, uh, the education, the conservation and research. Um, so in, in the field of education, Karumbe implements different educational programs and activities uh, to create awareness and, and empower the local communities for the conservation of their natural resources. <clears throat> um, yeah, we, we, we strongly believe that our conservation efforts uh, wouldn't make sense if we, we are not able to aware people of plastic pollution issues. So, <clears throat> because this is, a, this is a, a global problem, right? Which we are the, the ultimate uh, responsible. So, so it, its solution requires this, uh, the involvement of, of all of us. Huh? Um, in terms of conservation, <clears throat> Karun Bay also runs a, a stranding a rescue network and a rehabilitation center for, for turtles. Um, I have to say that unfortunately, uh, during the last years, the, the case of plastic ingestion have become one of the most common injuries that we, we attend in, in, in particular in, in green turtles. And our aims are, are clear. Uh, it's a uh, rescue, uh, rehabilitate, and, and reintroduce. Uh, and, and in particular, this, this last one is, I think, is, is one of the, of the best rewards of our labor is uh, you know, when, when, when we get to release back a, a turtle after its recovery. And these are usually public events, as you can see in the, in the picture. Uh, with many, many people, and, and it's amazing. It's amazing the energy generated in, in this event, and and obviously it's, it's also an excellent opportunity to to disseminate our our labor, our, our work. And about research, <clears throat> as you mentioned before, this is um well, this is a this is the the topic, by the way, of my PhD. <laughs> Uh, project that I'm currently uh, taking at JSQ University in Australia, as you mentioned before, uh, under the supervision of uh, Mark Hammond. And we are conducting different research lines. Uh, the first one is uh, about a, a comprehensive study of plastic ingestion over a wide range of green turtles in different health conditions during a time of period of six years. That includes stranded uh, or bycatch, stranded and bycatch turtles, rescue turtles, um, and wild turtles. So we, we are determining <clears throat> the characteristics and quantity of plastic ingested, the rate of ingestion, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, 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 and trust me that the results uh, so far are heartbreaking. Uh, we are finding huge amounts of plastics and in some cases, uh, in some cases, more than 600 pieces and 600 fragments of plastics in a turtle of no more than 40 centimeters is, is very dramatic, you know? Um, <clears throat> the second one is um, 
an evaluation of the plastic pollution levels, uh, which the turtle are exposed in, in Uruguayan waters, and also a spatial temporal analysis of the, the dynamic of plastic debris in, in these waters. Um, and yeah, once we complete uh, these two research line, we will be able to, to conduct a, a risk assessment of plastic ingestion at, at population level, or more specifically, over the stock population of green turtles present in, in Uruguay. <clears throat> so we aim to determine the, the likelihood of plastic ingestion by these green turtles according to the specific levels of uh, plastic pollution in, in, in Uruguay. Huh? Um, and yeah, this is our, our research goal uh, to evidence the, the daily hazard of plastic for, for turtle populations in this kind of, uh, of hot spots. No? Um, yeah, that's all, that's all. This is a, a short overview about uh, what we are doing in Uruguay to deal with this uh, horrible situation of plastic pollution. <laughs> Okay, well, that's the end of Danny's video. Since we don't have him here to answer questions, um, you see his email there. Feel free to shoot him an email. He says he's happy to answer any questions about his work. You can check out his organization there, karumbe.org. Like I said, I will send out um, these things um, as well. So, all right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to uh, introduce Sabine. Sabine is a purpose-driven conservationist and social entrepreneur. She is the founder of Sea Turtle Conservation Curacao. If you're not familiar with Curacao, it's uh, an island in the Caribbean, almost to, to South America, right? Like you guys are pretty far down in the Caribbean. It's a, is it mm. a Dutch colony? It's so 70 kilometers away from Venezuela. 17, 17, 70, 70, 70 70 70 well, that's that's swimmable <laughs> <laughs> almost yes um and she's also the founder of uh green phoenix um which with for which she wrote a um a really great case study um for the book that goes into some detail but i really wanted to have you join here um sabine because i really think the work that you guys are doing there with green phoenix is really inspiring and I think really on the front edge of the effort within the sea turtle community to um, try to repurpose plastic, to try to benefit communities and conservation efforts. And now you can tell me, how do you pronounce your last name again? Edense. Okay. So <laughs> of, of uh, hosts to not, not get that down ahead of time, I, I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to uh, pass it over to you now and you can get started. Uh, I think you have to make me, oh yeah. Uh, well, share my screen. All right, so thank uh, you so much. Yes, it's going. Great, great. Uh, let me see, go away please. Uh, yeah, slideshow, sorry for that from the beginning. So uh, yeah, everybody, uh, Brett, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this and putting it together. And uh, Danny and Chris, thank you for these wonderful presentations and also introductions to this huge problem that we're facing globally. Uh, so my name is Sabine Berense, uh, and uh, I am the founder, like Brett said, from Sea Turtle Conservation Curacao, as well as Green Phoenix. And it all started with Sea Turtle Conservation Curacao. Um, until the end of 2019, uh, we collected 215,000 gallons of marine debris from our shorelines. So Curacao is a very small island, so this amount is immense. And then, uh, as Chris explained, sea turtles that come trying to find a spot if there is like layers and layers and layers of plastic on top of the sand as well as below the sand. It's nearly impossible. Um, so we really want to contribute something to the habitat of sea turtles by cleaning it up. But if you're doing that long enough, and I feel like a decade of experience with this, you get a little bit frustrated because what you're basically doing in Curacao and 
many other Caribbean countries I think are similar. You're collecting plastic and you're bringing it to a landfill where it remains to be a problem. You're just relocating it. And for the sea turtles, it's obviously better, but it's not a solution. So we started to think about, you know, how should we, how can we find a solution for, you know, so much plastic stopping to end up in the ocean. And then we basically came to a conclusion for us that a circular economy is the only way where, you know, the whole design process is basically being um, changed, where there's no waste, there's no pollution, because it's, Plastic pollution basically is a lack of efficient waste management. Um, and when you want to have a create a circular economy, you also have to include everybody in the society. So that's basically the starting point. Um, so yeah, the 250,000 uh, gallons of plastic uh, was until the end of 2019. And plastic pollution is not a problem of Curacao. It's a worldwide uh, problem. and it's also very costly to get it out of the earth as fossil fuel, make it from oil into a product and then transport it somewhere over the earth. It's a lot of energy uh, used to there. And then we use it for a few minutes, like Chris explained, and then we throw it away, which basically makes no sense if you look at all the energy that's going into it. And then for Curacao specifically, our landfill has a limited capacity and research shows that it's only six years until it's reached the maximum capacity. So we came across a, plastic, a precious plastic community. This is a, basically a global community of people that like to design my stuff. And Dave Hawkins, a Dutch guy, designed four machines that he put out there open source. So it enables everybody that wants to do something with waste plastic to recycle it into new products. So this is a really lovely idea and we try to connect it or we're connecting it with conservation and that's that's how our project started. In the mid 2019 we bought four machines and because we had the four machines we um, approached the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs and they say well okay uh, we said we have the machines now and but we need to collect plastic we need to process plastic before we can recycle it so how about, you know, we give people that have been unemployed for a very long time a chance to come and learn on how we do that, because if they're picking up this idea, you know, they can do it. And, and then, you know, if more people start to do it, it makes more impact. So this is my backyard and this is where it all started. And then it's very cool because we had the people, we had the machines, so now we needed the plastic. And, you know, you can get plastics everywhere, but you want to have a large amount of the same type of plastic. Um, so what we decided to do is we have these machines now, This in the bottom you see uh, the 3D printer, you put the powder of plastic that we collected in there, and then basically you can 3D print a new item that you design yourself. We have the kids uh, ride a shredding bicycle so that the plastic that they bring from their house, they can make into small uh, little pieces, and then they can see the whole process. But before that, we have to remove a label, we have to remove the bottle cap. And we went into classes and we saw 3,000 kids. And we told them all about sea turtles and you know our love for sea turtles and our efforts, what we're trying to do to protect them and protect their habitat. And we also told them that the prognosis is that if nothing changes on a large systematic scale, we will have more plastic in the sea than fish by 2050. And that's something that we honestly are trying to prevent because this is not a future I like. So I want to take action to change it. And obviously when you're doing presentations, it's always a big question is, does what you're saying impact or have the impact that you want to have? So what we did is we wanted to make it measurable. So what we asked them is, okay, you could help us easy First of all, try and reduce your plastic use because that would be the best. If you cannot avoid plastic, please don't throw it in the garbage bin because our garbage bin puts everything in it and it goes to the landfill. Please, please, please save it from going to waste, bring it to us and we will ensure it will be recycled. 
So 3,000 kids, and we hoped that we would collect 10,000 bottles. But we went way over 30,000, which was a really good, you know, good thing for us because this showed that, first of all, we had the impact that we wanted to, but also it helped us to collect the data because we marked every, every bottle that came in, what type is it? Um, and then we, we made a not so nice discovery. It's like 95% of the plastic that we got in from the, from the kids is PET plastic. So PET plastic is plastic that when it breaks down in little particles, it sinks. It's not washing up on the shore. So the plastic that we're seeing on the shorelines and the plastic that we're seeing in the plastic soup floating on the surface, that's not PET plastic, unless it's a bottle with still with air in it. But I thought that was very shocking. But so we, we had these 30,000 bottles in my backyard that was not a very sustainable solution for, my, for me because my personal life was not so existent at that time. And then I, I went into a lot of presentations and everywhere I go, everywhere, everywhere I went, I, I was asking, can you please, please give us another location so we can you know, go there with the people and the machines because it's getting a bit, a bit overwhelming in my house. And then in January, I met somebody that says, yeah, you can come and have a look. And then half of this beautiful building is now a production facility for Green Phoenix. So we have several little rooms. One is for sorting, one is for washing. Uh, it was a really cool place. But we were very enthusiastic to start here. And then the COVID hit. So we went into a full lockdown, which was a, a little bit uh, difficult for us. Um, but then... Um, because we have 3D printers, we were able to make uh, face shields. So these are face shields that you just put on your head. We made a few uh, adjustments to the open source design. And it sounds a bit silly, but like everybody in our group needs uh, a feeling that they're contributing to the community, right? So this enabled us to get Green Phoenix <laughs> into uh, uh, into a European Union grant, which would give us more um, um, more capacity to print different things, also with recycling. Um, and well, that enabled us to open a new facility even in Sambiu. Uh, and that the cool thing about this is that instead of scaling down because of the COVID, we were actually able to double our team because the ministry was looking at what we're doing. Uh, so we can recycle more plastic, we can collect more plastic, uh, and we can also make more impact in people's lives because most of the people that are in our project have been unemployed for years. Um, and they actually are really driven and, and hardworking people. So uh, I'm so lucky to work with them. Um, but also because of these new locations, uh, we are now currently in the second version of Make the Turtle Smile. We all already collected 20,000, but the goal again is 30,000. And version three is already secured. So that means that before the end of basically the half of 2021, we would have collected 100,000 bottles uh, just by kids and you know people that want to contribute coming to us. Um, we're also going to companies and trying to, you know, make them um, change their practices. But then again, if they cannot avoid plastic at this time, that at least make sure that they're not throwing it away. Uh, we have amazing partners, and and I really say that uh, with the highest respect to everybody because we couldn't have done it without the contributions of each and every one of these. Uh, and. So Curacao is a very small island, but since we don't have a waste management system in place for recycling, uh, in my opinion, that's one of the biggest uh, threats from our island, because what we find on the North Shore of our island does not come from Curacao. We usually find things from Bonaire or from, from Venezuela or different, different other, other islands. But we need to find a way to make it easier for people to actually recycle, because People would be, you know, uh, putting aside their plastic, but they have to get out of the house, get to a location and bring the plastic unless they, you know, have somebody pick it up or, or whatever. And to engage everybody, you know, we have to make it easier for them. So we want to put big collection containers, like 40 foot containers on several strategic locations on the island. And we're working really hard on that. 
And uh, well, the, the goal still is to create a circular economy in which everybody basically has a chance to join the program, learn about and find a working place where they have a, um, well, a valuable and meaningful activity for their days. Uh, and then it has to be sustainable. So that means that we have to find different ways to also um, ensure that the future of this program will be with even more impact than it's now. And well, we're going in the right way so far. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope it's clear. Yeah, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much, Sabine. Um, you know, I think you, you guys have come up with what I think is a, uh, yes, I agree. I, I, I am inspired by, by Sabine as well. Um, you know, I think you guys have, with this program, you know, figured out a way to involve the community in the conservation efforts, maybe not directly, they're not working on the beach itself, but figuring out a way to involve the community and benefit the communities um, around the island um, through this work. Um, and there's not that many organizations that have done things like this. Like there's a lot of organizations that have worked with ecotourism, for example, that gets local people involved. But I think this is a really novel way um, to, to address this problem and you know, come up with a, with a solution, especially in a place like you mentioned that does not have great um, you know, waste management um, services. So um, are there, I'm not seeing any, any questions. I had a couple here that I, uh, um, oh shoot, I need to find them here real quick. Sorry about that. Um, so, well, it's, all right. So just one quick question for you yeah. is, um, in terms of the connection between Green Phoenix and Sea Turtle uh, Conservation Curacao, um, does any of the products, like do, do it, any of the profits support the, yeah. the conservation efforts? It's, it, it's designed as such. So Green, uh, Green Phoenix is a social enterprise. Um, so in Curacao, we don't have a legal entity for this, but in the Articles of Incorporation, it states that if we make a profit and obviously profits is the means to get more impact, uh, but we can either um, use that profit to invest in things that will enable us to um, make more impact in plastic recycling um, or uh, create more employment on the island uh, or invest it in sea turtle conservation programs in the Caribbean region because that's basically my dream that a company as Green Phoenix can support conservation activities in the region because I feel as somebody is working as a founder of an NGO in this region that it's very difficult to get sufficient funding for your operations and then unless you're so driven and already kind of financially independent it's very difficult to, to work in this uh, in this field and, and uh, I, I just see so many, you know, very passionate people that would like to make a bigger contribution. But if you have to be focused on finding finances, you cannot focus on your conservation work. I think that's just a huge shame because conservationists are very, very highly needed in this region. Absolutely. Um, one other question that... Um that uh oh yeah good point uh christine um, in the chat there um one other question is you know it this i'm sure you've thought about this you know this could be a great model for other places to address pollution create yeah. income create jobs have you guys um thought about or been in touch with any other places about replicating this model in 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 other places uh, well, we've been advising some people through Zooms and, and chats and, and emails about setting up similar projects in their, their countries. Uh, but what we, we ourselves really want is now we have, you know, a facility set up, logistics set up, the community work set up. Uh, it would be really worthwhile for people that are interested in doing something similar to come and join us for a few months. 
and then you know we can share some experiences and then you don't have to make the mistakes that we made because they were plenty and it would be very very valuable to share the experiences but but i think you know being there firsthand and seeing how it works would be very insightful because not all of the things is, is as such uh, as it's very easy to explain in words you have to really experience it sure absolutely well um so we're at five o'clock um are there any other um questions um you know i see the somebody made a point in the q a about uh recycling which you know christine talked about a fair amount and and yeah we agree that you know plastics and, and sabine talked about it in the beginning of the of her presentation that recycling is not the overall answer um but you know really think that what they're doing there in curacao where they don't have great waste management the plastic is there they're using it as a resource to generate income um, for the communities, for the conservation work. Can I maybe yeah. go into that? Sure, absolutely. Because I have uh, I have plenty of conversations with like industry leaders, um, and then you know they would tell me uh, when I asked them why is your product not completely made out of recycled content because you choose virgin material, and the the idea of a circular economy which we are promoting is that there is no concept of waste and that then it goes into a design issue as well because um, our recycling is not the end goal we want to create a circular economy but you have to understand it in a very uh, profound manner because a lot of the bottles that we get cannot be recycled because it's mixed material the design is just idiotic and a company should be held responsible. I completely agree with Chris because there should be a producer responsibility for everybody that puts a product out in the market and then they can put a, a you know, they're putting a sign on it. Like this is number one, but number one is just a group of plastics. And it just tells you that this is this type of group of plastic. And in theory, it could be recycled but the way it's designed, it's very often impossible to do so. And, and so there, in my opinion, they should not be allowed, not any company should be allowed to introduce a product in a certain region where there is no recycling possibility because the, the whole science of which type of plastic it is, is very deceiving because people consider oh it you know, plastic could be recycled. And then uh, also, I think that governments, companies are not taking their responsibilities because they are letting economics prevail. But companies have the responsibility to, to protect us and our future generations. So they should make sure that products that cannot be recycled are not allowed. Simple as that. Absolutely. Christine, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I actually the sign this um, what people interpret as the recyclable sign, you know, the three arrows. Um, Walmart is actually getting sued since I think it came out around Christmas. There's a huge lawsuit, I think, in the state of California for mislabeling and pretty much deceiving people into believing that when there is the sign on it, it is it is actually a recyclable product, which it is not. Right? So it's, it's another form of, of, of lying and greenwashing, if, if you want. So I totally agree with you. I mean, the, the responsibility needs to be with the producers. And I think you actually asked about the governments. And I mean, I think the problem with the governments in certain countries, especially, is it's not very stable, right? So sometimes I feel that the companies themselves need to step up because the government will not do it on behalf of us as consumers. So I think that might work maybe in Europe or it might work in Australia, UK, US, but I don't know if you go into developing countries, if the government is really able to, you know, go against billion dollar companies in, in yeah, those kind of aspects. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Chris, Sabine, so great to see you guys. The sea turtle community is really, big family and uh, you were all friends and it's always great to see friends faces 
Um, like I said, I will send out an email um, to with links to all of this stuff and uh, a recording of this. So um, thank you so much for joining. Get involved. Tell the companies that you buy from, even if you don't buy from them, tell them to, you know, improve their products, to use more recycled material, to not create single-use plastics, encourage governments. Um, it can work. Um, just a real quick example, Greenpeace did a campaign last year to pressure Trader Joe's, a, uh, a brand here in the United States and some other places, because they use a lot of plastic in theirs, and they got Trader Joe's to commit to reducing their plastic usage by more than a million pounds a year. So voices can work. Um, consumers can work. Yeah. Anyway, thank you all so much. I hope you all have a great night and uh, we'll be in touch soon and hope you can join us again for another webinar. Bye everybody. Thank right. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night.